different <laughs> issue, but I mean, I, I just think it's interesting. There's a perhaps it's just because it's more fascinating to talk about what they might be doing rather mm-hmm. than actually saying, "Well, no, there's nobody there." You know, we're, <laughs> we're shouting into the void. <laughs> but it's just to think there are. If you think about um, going back to the Fermi paradox and things, even a really conservative um, estimate of it, it pretty much boils down to there are 100 Earth-like planets for every grain of sand on the Earth. That's a lot of Earth-like planets yeah. out there. And so surely there must be life. Now, whether or not it's intelligent, but they that, want wh- to, wh- to why, why surely? With them. Why surely? Because we don't know what the conditions are for abiogenesis, for the appearance of life and nothing. We don't know what happened on Earth. We know it happened virtually, certainly, virtually as soon as it could have done, which might make you think, well, it's dead easy. But as far as we know, it's just happened once. So there's no other forms of life on Earth. Now, either we ate it all, which is possible, and it keeps on evolving and we eat it. Mm. That was Darwin's solution. Or it just happened once. Furthermore, to get from a single-celled slime to anything interesting, that took an amazing chance, which wasn't even down to natural selection, which is this fusion of the two cells which produced the uh, the eukaryotic cell that we've got. And that, you know, that happened once in three and a half billion years and so you then yeah just once yeah, on a no, tuesday no, afternoon there's no need and it happened once. Happened. Uh, how can you be so sure that it only happened once in one location be- because our population genetics tells us as we look at the genetics of the of the mitochondrion which are these trapped bacteria we've got living inside us we're these weird hybrids we look at the genetics of the our, our nuclear genes and we can trace it all back to an event around about one and a half two billion years ago when this fusion happened and it's never happened again and there's no other form of life out there and without that we wouldn't have multicellular life and even after, after it happened we didn't get multicellular life for a billion years so there's nothing inevitable about any of this there's a series of chance events changes in geology comets arriving yeah. and that, that's what makes me just row back and think wow you know this is, i think this is an anthrocentric bias in a sense right yeah. because well we that's what we got oh, it's exactly that's all we've got but but and that's your, of course that shapes the ways in which we think about it but there very well could be life, even intelligent life, on another planet, and they're sitting there going, it's impossible, we only know <laughs> us. <laughs> and they're wrong because we're here, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I'm with you in the sense that we can't figure out the odds on it happening because it's, it's only happened once. But I don't know if that's the most solid evidence to say it can't and hasn't happened. I mean, I'm not talking to hyper-intelligent life, just life in, in general. Can you not take another view saying that given the conditions on planet Earth, it's the only way it could have happened. How do you mean it's the only way? Um, the, the way the, it did the happen. The sequence of events that led uh, from the first self-replicating molecule to the first uh, prokaryotic cell to the first... Uric- so that sequence of events, given the first starting point of a certain mixture of uh, molecules in a certain temperature, a certain environment, if you give that starting point, that's the only feasible way for it to progress, and therefore it progressed down that track. If you started with a different starting point, it would, would progress down a slightly different track. But the reason why we have what we have is because the starting point was a particular starting mm. point. But can you envisage a situation where um, life on Earth kind of just stalled at the single cell stage? You, well, it you did know. for most of you, them. Yeah, life, exactly. You know? And then you get the sort of Precambrian mm-hmm. yeah, explosion. That's, that's but that just the last doesn't seem five seconds in the minute of life on Earth. Yeah, you know, yeah. most of the time it's just slime. Yeah, yeah I mean, but so what? So what? <laughs> no, well, well, they, there's not going to be slime writing in the sky okay, and saying, look, you know, uh, piloting in, a, in another planet. <laughs> it might not be. It might not be uh, single cell organisms for a million years. It might be single cell organisms for ten million years, and then the spike could happen or 100 million years whatever or it might, or it might never happen or it might never happen because on earth it but took even then when you talk the about the, the probability universe. and uh, mm-hmm. of the number of earth like planets and the number of planets where life is possible etc cetera, etc cetera, even if you factor in a very low probability for us going from single cell mm-hmm. to multi cell mm-hmm. It's still, in my mind, just looking at the number of zeros you have to put after the one, it becomes inevitable. Well, I don't know about inevitable. So <laughs> let's just go back to that fusion event. If you think of, so this is, uh, it's, it's a, it is a single event yeah. on a Tuesday afternoon, somewhere in the sea, one cell engulfs another because it's going to eat it and it goes wrong. And instead of eating it, the actual little cell is able to live inside the big cell. Now, how many zillions of times has that happened? Uh, uh, and it's still uh, happening today. Hang on a second, hang on a second. 
why did why should that event have happened just once why can't similar events have happened multiple times and only one of those events led to a viable entity because we'd see it living well it may have if it happened if well if you have a population if you have if you have 100 cells of one kind and 100 cells of another kind a big cell is going to swallow the small cell this doesn't have to happen just once no, it's only got to happen once to survive. There's no trace of it ever happened. Well, it's not actually quite well, true. It's not, there's no trace of it ha ever happened a second time because the sea is full of bacteria mm -hmm. and other single-celled organisms, and we only either find prokaryotes or are eukaryotes. Yeah. The only exception, and this is to give you an argument <laughs> in favour, is it did happen another time. It happened a second time. On a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> on a Wednesday oh. afternoon. How did you know? Yeah. When one of our, a, a eukaryote, which has already done this once, yeah. repeats the trick, mm -hmm. but with a bacteria, with a, an, a bacteria that can capture light. And that creates the plants and algae and red kelp and other stuff. So it has happened twice on Earth. Once to get eukaryotes and then once much later to get animals that can, plants that can photosynthesize. So you could say, well, in fact, it's quite likely because it happened twice. Well, hang on a second, because when you said, back, when you said the big bacteria ate the small bacteria, yeah. if the same kind of big bacteria ate the same kind of small bacteria, that could have happened twice, 10, 50 times. The end of times. result is the same. No, it didn't. No, the end result is food. That's, so it's no, normally easy. If, if it incorporated, when I say it, I mean yeah, but that's incorporated. What, that's what in, seems to have happened once in three and a half billion years. But why should it have happened just once? There's no argument that it only happened once. If it happened identically a second time, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Oh, it's not going to happen identically. Why not? The genetic, well, because they're not going to be exactly the same. Well, it might have, okay, it might have happened ten times in a population of cells. Yes, okay, that's what. But okay, it didn't times. happen on the other side of the Earth because we'd be able to see the traces in the genes because these weren't identical genes, that weren't identical organisms, absolutely genetically identical sure. organisms that fused. Sure. So if it happened a second time, we'd be able to see all our sequencing mm -hmm. of bazillions of bases shows that all life comes back to, or eukaryotic life has a common origin. And that is, that, that's simply the fact. So if they'd found anything different, mm -hmm. we'd be very excited, but still like physicists, you'd be very happy to find the exception. I mean, can, I, can I switch it a, a little bit? And uh, even, if the, even if your argument holds the idea that, you know, it's such a rarity, maybe it couldn't have happened anywhere else, um, and not to go pseudoscience, but the <laughs> idea of panspermia, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we no, know it, that yeah. bacteria can survive in really radical conditions like outer space. Mm -hmm. So if it had happened on Earth, you know, 3.5 billion years ago, then maybe something from yeah. Earth has traveled. Well, I think that, that's the first thing they'll do if they find stuff on Mars yeah. is to check that it's not us because yeah. or that we're. Well, that's going to be a really know, difficult. Go. <laughs> that's going to be a hard one, isn't it? I yeah. mean, <laughs> finding life on Mars or on Europa or in, in Enceladus that will be a big news story. But then piecing together the connection between that I guess life you'd and be life on Earth it to, to bacteria rather hmm. than. I mean, so sequencing bacteria is much easier than sequencing complex multicellular yeah, yeah. organisms. It is trivial, yeah. relatively it, it, trivial. It, I mean, yeah. which is why we can do the, the microbiome project because we can sequence, yeah. you know, trillions of bacteria now all at the same time and, and look at their relationship. So, like, say, it's like 50 years from now, we find life on somewhere out in the solar system. Do you think it'll be relatively straightforward to determine whether? Th that was like two two genesis of events, if you like. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Absolutely trees. straightforward. Yeah, we're doing okay. it in the lab at the moment yeah. with, with so, the guts. Okay. I mean, G DNA sequences now are this big, literally. Yeah. So you can yeah. get a DNA whole genome sequence. Well, what, even once you sequence the genome, genome, you then you then have the. Um, you know, the theoretical background to say whether that's whether they're part of the same family tree yeah, or not. You look at the differences, and right? You can, okay. you, uh, my guess is the, and the functional you, outputs. Yeah. Yeah. So you can look at those sort of metabolites and see, you know, what do they make? How do they work? And I think that's quite an important. So the stuff on well. Mars, you'd be able to say it probably got there on an asteroid that hit Earth and then bounced off. Yeah. You know, n billion years ago. I'll try to burst your anthropocentric. <laughs> <for one> <laughs> sorry, it's very strong. Um, you have this argument. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going back to what you said before about the single uh, creation event of life creation event. Um, maybe we live in a horrible, terrible planet where it only happened once, and we think that that's the norm. In another planet, it could have happened 500 times, yeah. and there could be 500 different kinds of species. Absolutely. So why are we trying to make this argument that it's very, very rare just because it was rare on Earth? Because that's the only data point we got. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's it. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, so my, my 
reservations are based partly on the assumption that you can simply multiply up like Drake did initially with mm. his Drake equation, where in fact the probability, if you had an Earth-like planet, the probability of life appearing was one, and then the probability of that life getting into space was one, and that seems a trifle over-optimistic. Um, so that's rather what I'm getting at, is just trying to get away from the idea there's anything inevitable about us. I mean, I suppose that could be the problem if there were multiple sort of generations of, of some form of life. I mean, one of the advantages, I guess, on Earth is that we were able to breed and expand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could breed with the, the Neanderthals and sort of humanoids and, and other things, and we could you know, expand because we have some genetic similarities. Whereas if you've had lots of different evolutionary events, you would be very diverse, and then you can't cross-breed, you would assume and therefore that might make it more And this table would need to be a lot bigger, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you have to have the yeah. centaur over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think problem. it's so cool that you can see Neanderthal genes in yeah. modern yeah. humans it even is, now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, may maybe we're thinking yeah. the wrong way. Maybe, I, may, I take your anthropocentrism, right? You were on nano stuff. Maybe they are here. Maybe they're here in the dust around us. How small could they get? How, you know, what's the physical the smallest physical size we could have if you were going to design life uh, 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 an intelligent yeah life which can have consciousness well, or even, and even that no no no, no 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 just slime you know <laughs> how small could it be I mean, you, you could it be smaller than a single cell organism yes just if you're just trying to look for something if your definition of life is self replication then it can be extremely small mm. we mm. can we can make a well, molecules can be self-replicating. Yeah, I mean, that is a problem. Yeah. That's why we wouldn't go with yeah. that, because crystals copy themselves, exactly. and they're not alive. So um, we so don't actually is, so have a definition of life. Where are you drawing that life, boundary? Like I, I could, like I said, I could, I could call a, a well-defined crystal as an as a inorganic life. Mm. Self-replication is your only criterion. But then, where do you draw the line? Self-replication plus information processing, or something well, like that. And information interaction processing makes and it interaction with the environment, because yeah. that's what you got to do. I yeah. mean, so they, there's no, uh, you know, A-level students learn Mrs. Gren movement, respiration. Yeah. I've forgotten the answer. Sensor, <laughs> sensory. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole set of set of stuff. Because there is no definition of life. Because flames self-replicate. Yeah, but we don't consider yeah, flames. Absolutely. To be. So whenever you try and we don't, and biologists don't just the avoid virus that. Because virus is always we, the one that, that people. Yeah, discuss. people get very cross about whether we don't think viruses. Do you think viruses are alive? Well, they don't replicate themselves. They, no, they get somebody just else bits to do of it for them. Replicating. But that's still <laughs> very <laughs> clever. That's probably more clever than trying to do it yourself. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, they came from us, so they, you know, they are bits of bits of DNA that have just gone off and done their own mm. thing. But could, you know, could there be, so, you know, the traditional alien is a bug-eyed monster, yeah. could it be a, you know, a, no bigger than a cell? Could it be a nano thing? But a nano thing that's able to communicate and respond to the environment? Yeah, I don't, how, I, how, 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 what would be the size limit on that? Do you and self-replicate. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> it would have to be bigger than, than a cell, I would imagine. If uh, you built it out of normal matter, presumably, but if you start getting into sort of... <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's cheating. Neutron you know, star you densities, you can do lots of things, can't yeah, you? Look, you can on paper. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot you can do on paper. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't, I'd never say never. Yeah. Uh, we are not advanced enough to do that, to build stuff with non-atoms, let's say. Like, I, I can't build something with just electrons. Or I can't build something with just neutrons. The way our, physically, the way our universe is put together, you can't make a bunch of neutrons move around um, doing stuff. It needs to be in the form of uh, an atom. So does that, make, does that mean that we couldn't have, say, plasma beings, you know, trying to think about something completely non yeah. what we are, you know, you have okay. just moving patterns of energy. Is that is that his domain? Is he just dreamt that up? No, that's Star Trek, isn't it? It's yeah. just science fiction, yeah. yeah the Star beings Trek. of pure energy. Yeah, they just yeah. zoom just in and <laughs> take you over and then <laughs> zoom out again. Um, no. Let me say that you... Okay. With my limited knowledge of, of that <laughs> level of physics, I'll say that it's more than mine. Um, you can't have beans of plasma in the three dimensions that we know, obeying the laws of physics that we know. Mm. Mm. Okay. There's no guarantee that the laws of physics we know are the only laws of physics. There's no guarantee that the three dimensions we know are the only three dimensions. If you are willing to grant that there is physics beyond that, then yes. You, so you said, oh, what about the laws of physics? Yeah. I mean, but on the other hand, you're quite happy to say that you can't manipulate non-atoms.